Good afternoon. My name is Kyle Roberts, and I'm the Associate Director of Library and Museum Programming at the American Philosophical Society. Welcome to the third day of the APS virtual conference, Responsibilities, Reciprocity, and Relationships, Indigenous Studies in the Archive and Beyond. I'm glad that so many of you have been able to join us today. The American Philosophical Society resides in Lenape Hoking, the homeland of the Lenape people, whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. The APS acknowledges with respect their continued presence and perseverance and expresses its sincere thanks for the past and ongoing generosity of numerous indigenous communities and individuals who've offered their guidance, their expertise, and opportunities for collaboration. This week's conference is inspired by the important work of the APS's Center for Native American and Indigenous Research and the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation funded Native American Scholars Initiative Program. For those joining us for the first time, the American Philosophical Society was founded by Benjamin Franklin in 1743. The Society is a catalyst for the discovery of new knowledge. Election to membership honors those who have made exceptionally significant contributions to science, the arts and humanities, and public life. The Society promotes research by providing over $1 million in research grants a year, primarily to younger scholars who need the support the most. Our library and museum collections and research centers serve scholars and visitors from around the globe. Please check out our website, amphilsoc.org, to learn more about what we do and for news of forthcoming events. We're using Zoom webinar mode today, so not to worry, you have all been muted. You won't accidentally interrupt the conference. If you have a question, please use the Q&A button at the bottom center of your navigation bar. You might wanna locate that now. You can type your question there at any point in the panel. So when the question comes to mind, go ahead, enter it. We're gonna leave about 15 minutes or so at the end of the panel for your questions of our speakers. We're also excited to offer closed captioning for this conference. If you'd like to use the closed captioning during the panel, please click on the CC box, again, on the bottom navigation bar of Zoom. It's to the right of the Q&A button. With that, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Marge Bruchak, who will be moderating panel three, Indigenous Researchers in Non-Native Archives. Margaret M. Bruchak Abenaki is an Associate Professor of Anthropology, Associate Faculty in the Penn Cultural Heritage Center, Coordinator of Native American and Indigenous Studies, and Consulting Scholar to the American Section of the Penn Museum at the University of Pennsylvania. In her multimodal career as a performer, ethnographer, historian, and museum consultant, Bruchak has long been committed to critical studies of colonial histories, archives, and museums while developing interpretations of indigenous histories that challenge erasures and stereotypes. I'll share in the chat box a link to the restorative research project, The Wampum Trail, that Professor Bruchak directs at Penn. It tracks the circulation of wampum belts through museums and tribal nations, focusing on the meaning, materiality, curation, and repatriation of historical wampum objects over time. Her 2018 research article, Broken Chains of Custody, Possessing, Dispossessing, and Repossessing Lost Wampum Belts appeared in the APS's own proceedings. Her 2018 book, Savage Kin, Indigenous Informants and American Anthropologists, published by the University of Arizona Press, received the inaugural Council for Museum Anthropology Book Award. And with that, again, thank you for joining us today, and I will turn it over to Professor Bruchak. Hi, greetings. We have three candidates, three, three panelists today, and we're starting with Johanna Bird, a PhD candidate in English at McMaster University studying indigenous literatures. Johanna has spent much of her life in the prairies, growing up in Manitoba and completing her undergraduate degree in Saskatchewan. She is mixed settler Anishinaabe of Peguas First Nation in Treaty One territory. Her SSHRC funded research considers writing as a relational practice that mediates and negotiates different relationships in oppressive contexts of the prairies in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Her research interests include indigenous literatures, early indigenous writing, life writing, poetry, and spirituality and religion in indigenous literature. Our second panelist, Kevin White, is Mohawk from Aquasasne with family from the Tonawanda Band of Seneca. 
Kevin is an assistant professor in the Department for the Study of Religion and Center for Indigenous Studies at the University of Toronto. Kevin started at UToronto in 2019. He was a Fulbright Fellow at Brock University, where he worked with the Indigenous Knowledge Center at Six Nations Polytechnic. Previously, he was faculty and director of the Native American Studies and American Studies programs at SUNY Oswego. His research focuses on the Haudenosaunee creation narratives and storytelling as a way of better understanding cultural knowledge and the history of those who have long called Turtle Island home for generations. Kevin aspires to help students and others face squarely the complicated past we all share. Our third panelist this afternoon, Leandra Skinendor, is a citizen of the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin. She is also Prairie Band, Potawatomi Nation, Muscogee Creek Nation, and Seminole Nation of Oklahoma. She was a 2019 NASI intern at the American Philosophical Society, where she first experienced what it was like being in the archives. Currently, she is a black ash basket weaving apprentice with master black ash basket maker April Stone from the Bad River Band of Lake Superior Ojibwe through the Mentor Artist Fellowship Program with the Native Arts and Cultures Foundation. When she's not learning how to make baskets, Leandra likes listening to poets talk about their poetry. And she also likes being by the water and with her family. And without ado, here are our presenters. Hi everyone, um, I'm so honored to be here and present with um, this group of panelists today. My thanks to Marge for moderating this panel and to my co-presenters, Kevin and Leandra. Miigwech and I look forward to our conversation. I'm speaking to you from the Dish With One Spoon, Hamilton, Ontario, home to the Haudenosaunee, specifically the Six Nations of the Grand River and the Anishinaabe, the Mississaugas of the Credit. And I would like to honor these host nations and express my thanks to the networks and relations that have become a part of um, an important part of my time and work here in Hamilton. As Marge said, I'm a non-local mixed settler Anishinaabe from Treaty 1 territory in Manitoba, and I'm a member of Pegwis First Nation. I have spent most of my life in the prairies, and this be has become the um, sort of the grounding place and, and site of my dissertation research, uh, and which I'm doing at McMaster University in the Department of English and Cultural Studies. So I look at late 19th and early 20th century ind uh, indigenous writing in English language in particular from Saskatchewan and Manitoba. And I consider how writing and storytelling um, is relational practice that negotiates a range of relationships with settlers, between and among Indigenous peoples and with land, namely the Cree, Métis, and Anishinaabe of Saskatchewan and Manitoba. However, as many of you know, Indigenous writing from this period and from these territories is understudied, and my dissertation engages with these earlier texts not as a way of recovering the past or reinstating a whole sense of Anishinaabe, Cree, or Métis histories or cultures, but rather, I want to follow from Maori scholar Alice Deponi Somerville's work here and think about researching our literary genealogies um, in ways that are, uh, in thinking about Indigenous research, research genealogies as framed in relation that acknowledge intergener intergenerational relationships and acknowledge all that we may not see or hear in our research, in particular, our archival research. Thus, I do not want to claim um, in working on Indigenous literary geneal genealogical work to be, to be making claims of arriving at or reaching back to some clear point of origin. What we see and read in an institutionalized or colonial archive does not represent or stand in for the whole of a community or Indigenous experience. The texts I study have limited publication reach, so I am led to archives to consider how these texts were and are mediated and framed, both at the times of their publications and in our present moment. The allure of archives, and I borrow um, from the title of Arlette Farge's book of the same name, the allure of the archives for many Indigenous scholars such as myself is the desire to work on these literary genealogies to try to access our ancestors in some way through this work and through the documents we might find in institutional archives fraught as they may be. 
But it is precisely this fraughtness that provokes a number of questions for the Indigenous researcher in these spaces. And I'm thinking of non-Indigenous archives, such as state archives, um, perhaps church archives, the Hudson Bay Company archives um, in Canada and Britain, for example. How do we, as Wabanaki scholar Ashley Elizabeth Smith asks, how do we interpolate colonial archives that they might better become part of Indigenous networks, become spaces for Indigenous gathering? Scholars like Ashley, Ashley Elizabeth Smith, Miami scholar Ashley Glassburn Falsetti, Maori scholar Alice Tepena Somerville, Cree scholar Winona Wheeler, and others have written about their various meetings with encounters in colonial archives and how they negotiate their relationships to the materials they study, as well as to the communities they bring with them into the archive. And I want to build on this work by, in the few minutes that I have, um, I want to dwell on the notion of care in relation to archival research. And in thinking about this, I want to acknowledge um, how this has been brought, provoked for me by conversations with colleagues at McMaster in, in other areas. When we enter the reading room of an archive and are handed materials to study, we are often instructed in a form of care for said object or text, care taken with how we handle it, how we prop up the book or weigh down the pages, what writing materials we use, what food and drink we leave at the door, etc. In part, this care is required to assist in preserving the object for future study, to limit wear and tear. In my experiences of archival research, I've had varying um, ranges of intensity around care for materials with, with uh, archivists and archival staff. Some staff invite you into these practices of handling with care as a colleague, as a researcher who has a right to study these materials. Some archivists and staff, however, seem to prioritize care of the materials over care for the visiting researchers, allowing, in my experience, my interactions with them to be guided by a kind of concern and, concern and at times mistrust, as though I am not the intended person to work with these materials. And perhaps historically, um, I haven't been, or I wouldn't have been. I'm just thinking of um, an interaction I had with a, a staff person last summer who was responsible for a particular collection I wanted to access. And the collection was all available on microfilm, which I had been studying, but there's something about the materiality of the objects that is also really important for studying archives and thinking of, about the different kinds of learning we can have from encountering the object itself, unmediated by a screen. However, I was hesitant at that time to initiate a conversation about my work and what I believe to be my claim to work with the items, feeling the pressures of my precarity as a graduate student and not wanting to perhaps jeopardize a necessary relationship um, in a very limited time frame that I was able to be there. And also just not wanting to experience f further rejection of my work or of um, the claims that I feel I have on, on materials. So I did find a different way to kind of circumvent that, to access the materials, but it raised the question for me, who are these materials for, um, if not me? Or what kinds of um, policies or practices guide access or hier hier that might hierarchize um, research um, and access to materials? whose care is being prioritized. Furthermore, what about when materials or objects themselves do not care for us or for our ancestors, when they are violent or contain violences that affect us now in the present moments of research as well as more broadly in the concerns that we have as Indigenous people. With limits on funding and time to sit with an archive, I, as I'm sure many researchers do, often find myself trying to move quickly through the material. Um, to get what I need while I'm there. But I, have I been trained to, to deal with those moments that, that will interrupt, whether they've accrued slowly over time or it's a sudden encounter in the archive that requires further care of myself because of um, the violence that's embedded in the text. An Anishinaabe approach to archival study with its attention to interdependence and reciprocity in relations requires attention to care, I think, to the communities who are or will be affected by our work, as Lisa Brooks reminded us on Monday, 
and also to our own care as Indigenous scholars who are often navigating spaces that were intended to contain records of us as objects of study. By way of contrast, my experiences at Indigenous archives like Deo Hahage Knowledge Center at Six Nations have been full of care for Indigenous researchers and for Indigenous knowledge and seeing how Indigenous peoples tend to and care for their own works, partnering also with other institutions for repatriation projects and knowledge sharing. But not every community has access to that kind of formal space to be called an, an archive in that sort of building sense of the, the word. So how can we support our communities through our work? Another call that Lisa put out on Monday to share what we know in ways our communities find useful, but also when archives often have restrictions around sharing, around this practice of care. Finally, if we believe that our research methodologies must be landed, what does that mean for the process of doing archival research? And how are Indigenous researchers resourced to do that work, especially when they don't have easy access to their home territories or other lands that they need to be with? Thank you. I'll jump right into it. Sego's going to go. Kevin White, Yungats. I'm a Mohawk from Akwesasne with family from Tanawanda. Currently, I live and work in the city of Takaranto, and I want to take a moment to acknowledge the lands that I currently live and work on has have long been called home to here, uh, home by the Huron Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississauga of New Credit River, and so many other Indigenous peoples and communities that now call Takaranto home today. So today. I will speak briefly on stories, languages, and the archives, and my attempts to engage in Haudenosaunee-centered community work. I have long studied the narrative of creation and have had the privilege to travel to most of the Haudenosaunee communities and indeed the world now talking about Haudenosaunee creation. But much of my work has been centered on the published narratives alone. And the great conversations I've had with so many in my travels, it is important to emphasize that these were all published books. So shh, don't tell anybody that I have not visited the archives yet. I had great opportunity to work with Rick Hill, Deo Hahage, and so many others at Six Nations Grand River, a place that many consider an important stronghold of cultural knowledge and language, all while on my Fulbright in 2017. I will note that for me, it was an opportunity to talk to and visit with and walk quietly among the community that JMB Hewitt did seemingly so long ago at Grand River where he gathered stories and knowledge and indeed the language of Chief John Buck, Chief John Arthur Gibson and Seth Newhouse for two Onondaga versions of creation and a Mohawk one. I would be remiss if I neglected to mention Hewitt's other Seneca version as told by Chief John Armstrong from Cattaraugus. My note in all of this is to illuminate that there is already great work being done in community with stories, with indigenous knowledge, indigenous language and archival work. One of the Deo Hahage's focus is to work with archives and recover and restore indigenous knowledge and language for future generations. This paper was to be part of a larger panel with Ryan DeCare, Taylor Gibson, and Chandra Miracle. A Chandra Miracle. Unfortunately, as we all now realize, COVID has altered our opportunities and how we engage with one another. NASA 2020 was canceled due in the early stages of the pandemic, but that doesn't mean the sharing of stories and knowledge and language has stopped. I wish to take another moment to explain why I admire and wanted to work with these three community members, educators, and scholars. Ryan is doing great work with teaching language and is someone who has taught me the tremendous respect for the need to learn my own language. Taylor has done an amazing, even breathtakingly deep dive into the wall collection and all of the indigenous knowledge it holds. Chander has done incredible work with corn, with language, and with education for future generations and is indeed doing her own work as a PhD candidate now. I wish they were here with me now among the other panelists today who I'm equally honored to be here with and speak to all of you today. Given the brevity of our panel, please bear in mind that this is presentation will scratch the surface of a much deeper rumination on this topic for myself and the work I've done with the community at Six Nations and indeed the Confederacy. One of the responsibilities I think we must shift in our collective thinking and curiosities is this notion of how we understand and catalog time. We too easily and too quickly denote that knowledge, that knowledge is static and in view it from a perspective of decades and centuries ago when it was acquired. 
Yet, as I stumbled into this with one of my classes back in San Oswego, a slight shift in perspective radically alters our interpretations and our understandings. I had been teaching my class about the traumatic effects of the policies and brutal assimilation tactics of residential boarding schools in Canada and the United States. And while it is true that the US federal residential school policy stopped in the early 20th century, Thomas Indian School ran by New York State ran well into the mid to late 20th century. And here in Canada, resident school, residential schools ran well into the late 1990s. The net effect continues to ripple through communities and generations today. The student innocently asked the question of why this was important in light of the fact that it happened so long ago if boarding schools were stopped in the 1930s. And in that moment, I realized we examined history with the benefit of hindsight in relation to decades and centuries. We disconnect from the effects and indeed the loss of knowledge because it seemingly happened so long ago. Accordingly, we need to change our perspective on this. So if we take just a moment to shift the outcome and effects on individuals, families, communities, and indeed generations, then those painful and traumatic and toxic hostile policies are much closer to a lived experience than most are willing to face or acknowledge squarely and honestly. I responded to the student that day in Oswego that an everyday sense using my own family and how few generations from residential schooling I am actually removed. In that context, I am one generation. My father went to the mush hole in uh, Brantford and my great grandmother went to, from Tonawanda went to Carlisle. So one in three generations removed from these effects where if we engage in generational thinking, this should change our perspective on not only how we examine the resilience and perseverance of indigenous knowledge, but language and stories as well. For we must also remember and engage in the, in a, with a fact in my estimation that archives, academic research, and indeed assessment of cultural knowledge is born out of an era that sought to active actively terminate and negate the indigenous knowledge system through the extinction of language and cultural knowledge by name, by, in the name of civilizing the Indian and assimilating them into mainstream dominant cultures within Canada and the United States. Thus, the material culture gathered, the cultural knowledge, the language, and even physical culture was actively pursued and engaged by scholars in an extractive manner that sought to record for posterity and out of a sense of curiosity that which the federal policies deemed absolutely unnecessary in the name of assimilation. But I wish to also note that those who termed, who were termed informants may have deliberately and I believe consciously worked with academics to record this knowledge and particularly the language for future generations. I would propose that we consciously shift our collective thinking and research to acknowledge that the informant is no longer a viable word. They are and were knowledge holders and speakers that men like Hewitt worked with over the years. Even more important, we need to acknowledge that men and women shared the knowledge to, in our communities then and now. Through, though academics and scholars elevated men as informants, this was primarily due to patriarchy. Indeed, in many ways, it is ironic that we owe so much to salvage ethnography as it was an era where a lot of the materials in the archives was indeed recorded, extracted, cataloged, and preserved. I would note the next portion of this is equally important to consider as well. As materials begin to accumulate, men like Hewitt, Arthur Parker, Seth Newhouse began to retire and pass to a new generation this responsibility and workload. Scholars like William Fenton, who proudly proclaimed that he succeeded Fenton, Parker, and Newhouse, in the then fledgling field of Iroquois studies rose to prominence. Much like Hewitt and others, Fenton would go on to shape the field and generations of scholars, both indigenous and non-indigenous. And while many continue to view Fenton as the dean of Iroquois studies, there are times where his approach and indeed his scholarship can indeed be interpreted as polemic and problematic in areas. While many may know this, I will state for clarity that I view Fenton as my intellectual nemesis not out of a sense of envy or admiration, rather as a prime example of scholarship that followed Hewitt, Parker, and Newhouse in the form of what we would call today academic gatekeeping that would continue until quite recently, actually. In my estimation, Hewitt, Parker, and Newhouse were attempting to relate complex ways of thinking and indigenous knowledge systems in a format to relate 
or in a format and context that illuminated how deep the language, stories, and knowledge were braided together. To me, this is why Hewitt wrote the narrative portions of the Iroquois uh, cosmologies part one and two in a pseudo biblical like language. It was simply the most powerful book at the time and he wanted to, re to display the intellect in the story. Fenton readily dismissed Hewitt's efforts in his 1962 piece on the cosmologies. Even more prob problematic to me was that Fenton proposed most version and variations could be best attributed to each speaker attempting to place a stamp of ownership on the story. And so consequently, many, um, many scholars today simply refer back to Fenton's 1962 piece instead of studying the varied and nuanced portions and variations of the stories themselves. Um, I'm gonna to try to wrap up really quickly, but I wanted to kind of acknowledge that a lot of this comes from a way of thinking because of conversations I've had with uh, scholars like John Mohawk and Rick Hill and Jolene Rickard. And Rick Hill recently acknowledged on uh, a video of Voices from Here for Historica.Canada that indigenous communities and people were denied access to archives. That is changing through meetings like this, but we still have a lot of work to do. Um, and there is a couple points I wanted to actually make out of that, so bear with me just a second. Um, I wanted to emphasize that point too, that when we were talking about NAGPRA and the return of the wampum belts in the 1990s, Fenton took out a full, place, full page ad in the New York Times articulating that access to these belts may be lost to scholars and the belts may possibly deteriorate and be destroyed due to lack of proper care and conservation. We now know that to be a false claim or fear because this changed. In that kind of way of thinking, current generations can see and touch the belts and learn from the knowledge holders at the annual great law recitals. This is a demonstration of living, breathing, vibrant, and recovering cultural knowledge systems that archives play a role in, but that communities play a bigger role in. Um, so in the, I'm gonna end right there because I think I don't wanna go over and take too much time, so thank you. Okay. Hi. Um, uh, first off, thank you so much. I feel really grateful to be here and to have listened to everyone's presentation so far. It's such an honor and truly inspiring. Thank you to Marge and Johanna and Kevin for being here today and sharing. I'd also like to thank all the behind the scenes people who helped put this whole event together because I can only imagine how much work it takes for events like this to run smoothly. So for all your days leading up to this, I say thank you. Uh, my name is Leandra, and I'm from the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin, where I also live with my family. I'd also like to acknowledge the Lenape people and their homelands on which the APS resides. I'm reminded of Tommy Orange's novel, There, There, the title of which comes from a Gertrude Stein quote that reads, there is no there, there, when remembering the places where we come from and how those places no longer resemble the home we used to know. In an article by the New York Times titled Tommy Orange's There There is a New Kind of American Epic, Orange remembers these places of home as he says, buried ancestral land, glass and concrete and wire and steel, unreturnable covered memory, there is no there there. So, but despite these industrial changes to the land, that doesn't mean that the home for the people who come from these places ought to be forgotten because we no longer remember what the land looked like before being covered with all the buildings and highways. So, <clears throat> so though Philadelphia and the APS now exist on Lenape homelands and their lands of home have now changed in looks and health, this is still their home. And I hope we can be gentle with each other with the understanding that we have all made homes in previous homes. Even where I come from is within the homelands of the Menominee and Potawatomi. So what I'll be talking about today is how there's knowledge and poetry that can expand our understanding of history, just like there's knowledge in archives that help us understand history. I like to believe that stories and poems help us to imagine what can be, reckon with what has been, so that we, so that we may realize what doesn't have to be. Last summer, I remember I was in Philadelphia at the APS for my 
internship where I got to look at really old papers and it was really exciting. But during that time, I got a message from my mother and she was very enthusiastically texting how Joy Harjo is named the US Poet Laureate and would be succeeding Tracy K. Smith, who is also a brilliant, amazing, beautiful poet and writer. Um, Harjo became the first Native American to ever be a US Poet Laureate. And I thought, wow, that's really cool. But on a deeper level, I also think significant that was, and especially considering the history between the country and Native, and Native peoples, I couldn't help but feel like this was a hopeful turning point in our relations with each other, a relationship that can begin with poetry and one that can hopefully bring some forgiving and healing with poetry. Sapani journalist and writer Nick Martin wrote an article for CNN about Harjo named as US Poet Laureate and the hope that this kind of election and recognition inspires. He begins the article with a quote from one of Harjo's poems titled Grace. The line reads, I know there is something larger than the memory of a dispossessed people. We have seen it. For Martin to begin his article with the invocation of a line like that, I thought it was so powerful because in those words, there's the history of dispossession being acknowledged, but, and I would argue more importantly, there's the rehumanization of the people happening. In Janet Campbell Hale's memoir slash essay collection, Bloodlines, Odyssey of a Native Daughter, in one of her personal essays, she writes something along the lines of, I will always be estranged from the land I come from, a statement that confronts what dispossession has done to the mind and heart, let alone the violences that happen to the body during those removals. And then in Therese Marie Maya's memoir, Heartberries, she reminds us how we are more than what has happened to us in the past and in history. And then, when you, <clears throat> and then when you combine those two works and just sit and think about all the pains, the love, the sadness and happiness in life, I especially see the power in Harjo's line from Grace. I see how dispossession is what happened in the past and it does affect generations today. But I also see how generations of today still live with hope and care and humanity. And I see how our efforts to continue to be have taken the most beautiful forms as musician, educators, land and water protectors, artists, poets, mothers, fathers, historians, curators, dancers, the list can literally go on. So for Harjo to rehumanize people in her poetry and to say we can be more than what they only want to think of us as does give me hope like it does for Martin. Martin made a really good point in his article when asking if super fancy awards like being named US Poet Laureate <laughs> should be an opportunity for artists to bring attention to issues faced by their communities. Martin ruminates on these kinds of questions, but resists and writes, maybe that isn't the right question to place the responsibility on the few natives capable of demanding a nationwide audience is obviously incorrect but that there is a desire to do so at all hints toward a larger systemic issue of native erasure that to this day awaits an adequate governmental response. And I think that's a very insightful, intelligent way to remind us that these histories that we hold and know aren't meant to be the burden of a select few whose job it should be to be the ultimate knowledge keeper of all things, because that burden goes back to dehumanizing in a way that you're not seeing the person as a human that can tell you their thoughts, stories, ideas, and philosophies, but rather seeing that someone as a person who should just give you knowledge about whatever you want, whenever you want. And so I think this is where those themes of relationships, responsibility, and reciprocity for this conference come into play. That being that we all encounter each other and there is still a lot of communicating and listening we need to do. In one of Harjo's poems titled Conflict Resolution for Holy Beings, there's this one line that really sticks out to me. It's in the fourth resolution and its theme is about reducing defensiveness so that we may recognize how we're all here together trying to be together. The line reads, this is about getting to know each other. And when you think about it, history is a story of us trying to know each other and also a story of us trying to not know one another. <clears throat> Poetry is a good form, I think, for reminding us what we forget or choose not to remember about each other. It's a good form that brings feeling to history 
there's history that we know intellectually, and then there's history that we feel. And I believe that poetry can bring that human factor of feeling very deeply towards histories that we may not know. In another poem by Harjo titled, Everybody Has a Heartache, a Blues, the line repeated over and over is, everybody has a heartache, like the chorus of a song, a blues song. As we all lived through this summer and witnessed and heard what happened to George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Jacob Blake, and felt the uprisings and heard the chants of enough is enough, I remember thinking and still think how hurt we are by each other and how everyone does at some, at some time or many times have a broken heart. I attended relatively, <clears throat> relatively recently a virtual conversation put on by the Loft Literary Center where they had the poets and writers David Mira and Patricia Smith talk, talk as part of the Indigenous Writers and Writers of Color series. Patricia Smith talks about how people were asking her what to read during these heartache times, what poets to read, what kind of books to read, she remarked how a lot of people are turning towards poetry too, as she phrased, fill in the gaps. Gaps of understanding, gaps of history, of truth and empathy, gaps about what's happening in this country right now and about what has always happened. I thought it was very interesting how Smith was talking about the depth of knowledge that can be found in poetry, like how heavy with knowing a poem can feel when the poet writes something profound. After the conversation, I thought about how the knowledge of Black, Indigenous, and people of color lives have been dictated by settler colonial and white supremacist agendas and the effort to erase, subjugate, and dehumanize these lives in the mind of the nation and in the mind of its citizens. When Smith was discussing the knowledge that can be found in poetry about lives we do not subjectively know, I also thought about how poetry is a valuable form to reclaim life in a language that gives the poet life. When including poems in the study of history, history reshapes and expands. I think of poetry as also an archive of knowledge where poetry helps expand what we think of as knowledge between the written line after line on a page. Poems literally take the shape in an infinite amount of forms and whatever form the poet chooses to communicate their knowledge of what they want to say, reminding readers that knowledge is also visual. I think of poems that make use of space to convey elements like wind and waves and the poets who use space to convey silence and sound, the presence of thought but no language. And there's so many ways poets, there's so many ways poets find a way to bring that feeling of what they're saying to the reader. I know that for many Black, Indigenous, and people of color in this country, there's trauma around how our histories have been told and what those tellings have done to us then and now. Poetry written by ourselves helps to retell those histories of the personal, communal, and national from our own voices. These retellings help reshape our existing knowledge. Since I'm doing a lot of basket weaving work right now, I think of how the strips used to make a certain basket can also be undone to create a new basket with the same material. Baskets and poetry are constantly taking shapes from the old and new, and they're even rebraiding and weaving again what has been unraveled or torn, so that with some time, hopefully the strength comes to hold things and each other together. Just like there's knowledge in archives, and at the APS we have many wonderful people who carefully and honorably preserve that knowledge. <clears throat> there's also knowledge in poems, and what a gift it is that we can continuously forever learn. Thank you. Why greetings. So moving on to commentary, I would like to start with something that I overlooked in the haste of beginning the session, and that is a more, uh, a more expansive land acknowledgement, because I am currently situated in Nonatuck homelands in the Quinnitiqua Valley, Northampton, Massachusetts is how we know it today. I teach in Lenape homelands of Lenapehoking, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. But in all of these places, a land acknowledgement must go beyond simply recognizing whose territory we're in. So I find that in the work I do, and especially in this kind of outreach work, I'm constantly grappling with the devastation of colonial warfare, removal of the actions that separate these nations, not only from their homelands, 
but from their heritage, from their communities, and often from themselves. And as Kevin says so eloquently, from their knowledge of themselves, which has been filtered down through secondary scholars like, like William Fenton, even at a time when primary scholars like Hewitt and Parker and others were trying to tell their own stories. And so in all of this work, I'm constantly thinking, how do I acknowledge the indigenous people I work with today, particularly my Algonquian and Haudenosaunee colleagues, for their goodwill in doing this work at all? Because there are times when it's very easy to say we should be done with these colonial institutions. We should have nothing more to do with them, but yet they still hold materials that are so crucial to us. So I'd like to say a few words on our speakers, and then I'd like to share with you a few images to give you a sense of the of the way that I do this work, so how it sort of ties together. So Johanna ch challenges us to really say, how do we find ourselves in the archives? And this is why we need to physically be in the archives. It's not enough to see microfilm. It's not enough to send someone else in for us. It's not enough for a researcher simply to share what they have found, but we need to physically be there ourselves. And here I'd like to share something that I have learned I would sort of say the hard way from working very closely with Rick Hill. Because what when I started the Wampum Trail work with Rick Hill, what I learned is that indigenous scholars simply could not get at the materials that they needed to really understand how all of these broken pieces could be fit back together. So I am deeply grateful to my two graduate research assistants, Lise Puyo and Stephanie Mock. Stephanie comes to us from the Navajo Nation. Lise comes from France. Rick obviously is Tuscarora, and I think of these as absolutely essential partners. So even at a point when I am admitted to an archive because of my own status as a professor at a prestigious institution, I am always indebted to cultural scholars and knowledge bearers like Rick Hill and other indigenous people from the communities I work with. Because what we're doing is trying to reach back. In this case, these are this is a community at Rapid Lake, also known as Kitigan Zubi, Lac Barriere, with their wampum belts in 1914 in a photograph taken by Frank Speck. And those wampum belts are still held in that community, but they're held in secret because of the fear of losing things like this to the museum. And again, going back to Kevin's points, there is this, well, actually going to Joanna's points, and I'll come back around to Kevin's as well. But Johanna calls us to the importance of the materiality of the object itself, because the object lives differently in a community than it does in a museum. So often, if we cannot physically transport the object, we transport knowledge about the object back to the community it comes from. So in this case, Lise Puyo is reporting to Fred McGregor at Kitigan Zabi about a wampum belt that still lives in the Vatican. It's a very long story in itself, but there is knowledge in the community that is not in the Vatican and vice versa. In this particular image, I am comparing two wampum belts, one that lives at the Penn Museum, one that lives at the Canadian Museum of History. Each of them contains separate bodies of knowledge, but they have never physically been brought together. So sometimes we have to do this kind of object triage is the way I think about it. How do we stand in between the institutions and the communities and the archives and find some way again to fill in those gaps? And one of perhaps the most profound wampum bits of research I've been involved in was to find two wampum belts that had been purchased by Frank Speck in the 19 teens, had gone through multiple dispossessions and to finally through exhaustive diplomacy, including working with private holders of these wampum belts, they had left the museum and gone into private hands, to find ways to get them back into the hands of the community. And as you can see, there is something so different when these objects are alive as compared to when they are simply in the museum. And so what Johanna calls us to is how do we see ourselves? How do we see our ancestors? How do we see these objects in the archives? And how do we interpret care? And isn't it so interesting that care is differently applied to objects than it is to individuals? And so quite honestly, one of the reasons I went on to do um, higher degrees was to help younger people come in to gain access to those archives. So now let me comment a bit on what Kevin has brought to us. So I will be going back and forth between our speakers to give you some new insights, but Kevin asks us to do something very profound that indigenous knowledge keepers routinely do, that elders do, that ceremonial people do, and that is to consider time 
consider generational trauma. Consider the resonance of what has gone before, what we have forgotten, and what is embodied in us now as descendant communities, and what do we do with that? Now, I know informant's a dirty word. I used it quite intentionally in the same way I use savage in my book title, because in my interpretation, savage applies to the anthropologist more than it applies to indigenous people. But I used informant because that's how native knowledge bearers are being positioned at the time, as though they were the key to knowledge that could be captured and brought into a non-indigenous collection. So we are all in the process of turning that in reverse by saying, knowing that that knowledge is captured, where has it been captured? How has it been interpreted? What do we do with it? So when Kevin asks us to really consider, as Rick Hill does as well, the effects of the boarding schools, the active termination, the denial of access to our own ancestral knowledges, that is not yet, that process is not yet done. We do not yet have freedom of access. We certainly don't have freedom of ownership and we don't collaborate in ways that we could. So one of the things I always hope for out of a conference like this is that we'll inspire more collaboration among indigenous scholars and communities because in many cases we hold parts of each other's puzzles. And then to come around to Johanna. And so I, 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 I know I'm weaving back and forth and back and forth, but Johanna, introduces us to what Leandra is calling us to do, is to consider poetry. Because in all of this, there is grief, there is loss, there is trauma, there is recovery, but there is also poetry. And I love the poet she brings to us, something larger than the memory of dispossessed people, something beyond victimization and trauma, something we can live out of and through, because if we all have heartaches, we also all have the tools to heal one another. We all have the tools to humanize one another. We have the opportunity to do some kind of reparative action, restorative action, that can not only recover our understandings, but sort of bring us home again in some really profound ways. And so the last image I'd actually like to share with you on that note, again, comes out of the Wampum Trail research and it sort of emphasizes the importance of collaboration in all of this, because I had a very interesting experience last December, and it's something that is not possible at the present time, given the way that archives have shut down. But my dear colleague and friend, Laura Piers, the curator emeritus of the Pitt Rivers Museum, we received funding from Arts Council England to look for a lost Wampanoag wampum belt. And we used that opportunity to look for other wampum belts while we were in England. And we did this intensive survey to say what is known, what is not known, what could be known, where do we go with this? And although that work is still ongoing, it is so absolutely crucial. Because in many cases, here I'm just talking about wampum, but there is so much that we need to know and so much that these histories and these ancestral objects and these documents can tell us and so much that can inspire us. And so as part of that research, we were a small piece of an amazing moment of cultural recovery when a group of Wampanoag artisans decided to create a belt to take the place of the one that was gone. So that's also how I think of poetry. We create words to replace the sound of those who have passed on. We dream to recover the visions and the memories of those who can no longer speak to us. And when we go into the archives, what I think we do most effectively is to bring those thoughts and words and experiences to life again in ways that are useful to the communities we are part of today. So there is much more I could say, but I will stop there and leave it open for questions. Thank you. So looking at questions, I'm going to start with my dear friend, Kara Kermpodich at University of Toronto who appreciates how Kevin has raised gender as a facet of how archives are formed and imagined. So would any of you like to speak to additional thoughts about gender, whether the care and the feminization of archival practices and professions, or whether there are indigenous practices that could be better known? Anyone wish to speak to that? Kevin, I'll challenge you to go first. All right, thank you. Um, it is, it, it's, 
it's a very conscious effort now for me because I was, when I was at the tail end of the Fulbright, I did a presentation in Grand River at six and inadvertently I had invited only men to come up and talk. And some of the women challenged me from the community and said, where are the women? Where are the voices of the women? Um, and that made me start thinking about this much differently now. And, you know, and there's the other aspect of this too, in this capacity that um, I've had some really interesting conversations with Rick and Chandra about some of this and, and, the, and the way that Chandra, Chandra pointed out to me, as well as many others have that in this context, there's a lot of us that are in the academic arenas and theorizing and, and postulating this stuff. And then there are those people that are in the community doing the, the work on the ground. And, you know, we, we also have to have conversations too. And that's one of those things that I, I hearken back to some of my, you know, I think in some ways John was actually deliberately intentional in focusing me on the published materials because those would be easier to access since they're already out in the world rather than fighting with the archives to get into it. But Rick and I and, and others had this conversation in 2017 that it's now time for me to get into the archives because I want to see what Hewitt actually took out, left in, changed, altered in that capacity. And I'm hoping some of that material will be eventually in his archival materials. And so, but gender is a huge facet of this because if you look at, um, Taylor was showing me some of the stuff from the wall collection, there's stories for men and women because that's where the communal knowledge is. That's where the language is. And what I'm really fascinated by is this kind of cultural value system that is articulated and best understood by studying the collections of stories and not trying to understand how they were diffused, like Fenton suggests, but rather what can we glean from how so many different people understood a story or a series of stories that, and then applied it to this, you know, very big framework of good mindedness. And that's an important conversation to have. And it, it, it you know, it, it really does have to involve gender because it wasn't just men that were informants. Thank you. So building upon that, Johanna, can you say more about your experiences at the Six Nations Archives as a model for what non-Native archives can do to better care for Indigenous researchers? Yeah, um, and uh, if I may, I want to connect to just the, the question about gender as well. Mm. Um, I think the, so what being with Deo Hahage, um, and I've been there as kind of in like a volunteer capacity and as part of a sort of a research group that meets at Deo, Deo Hahage. And um, I think that things that I found really supportive and encouraging at Deo, Deo Hahage are things like bringing material culture, material culture and texts together and not necessarily thinking of them as separate so often it feels it seems as though sort of textual materials are in archives and then material objects are in museums right and um and being on a research trip in england with the supervisor there robbie richardson who's a mohawk scholar uh, sorry Mi'kmaq scholar in um uh, 18th century um you know he encouraged me you know get out to the museums and look at you're going to be encountering texts all day and writing by and about the indigenous folks that you're looking at, but go look, look for the basket weaving, look for the beadwork, look for the, the, the important objects that are, that are in museums in England that can speak to the text that you're reading, even though they may not be from the same communities even, but the histories of those objects um, have something to say. And so, Deo Hahage, you know, um, it's a library, it's an archive, it's, it's not quite a museum, but they have material objects there, like it's, and it's all kind of seen as flowing together and being, these things are being considered alongside one another and not separated. So that's something that's really important. I also just, like the first time I ever entered Deo Hahage, um, uh, Tanis, who's a, um, who works there, uh, asked if I wanted to do a little reading and started handing me, you know, handouts on the creation story, handouts on the, the great law of peace. And knowing that I wasn't from there and wasn't Haudenosaunee, but wanted to learn and get involved in, in the community there. So um, those are just a few things. And also 
it researchers come and they're treated like you have a claim to yes you should be working with these materials um just on the point about gender i would say that yeah just noting there are histories as the question and asker noted and as kevin noted to sort of the patriarchal formation of some archival repositories right um there are say anglican missionary texts that i read where there are very few if any women writing um and there are histories to that we have to unlearn and and um and part being with deo hojave is part of that process of unlearning johanna i'm sorry i'm sorry thank you johanna uh, leandra uh, um so I'm not really sure how to answer the question since like I was only in the archive for I think like eight weeks this summer and it was my first time kind of going through all the shelves and looking at all of these like old objects and everything and so so that was like a completely different experience of like learning about how things used to be through like this yeah, through like the archive experience basically because like otherwise before that i just like like i'm an avid reader so i just read a bunch of poems and stories and then like i also have like my, my community and then i also have my um like my cultural works and everything like with basket weaving and then learning from my grandma that's kind of like kind of how i know things so it's just yeah so i don't i don't feel like i have enough experience in in archives quite yet to really say much about it but i hope to someday <laughs> well leandra we have another question directly for you from okay. myra tuttle who's asking if you could recite the poem grace oh um like is it the the line that they want to hear i'm not sure Okay, because the line, you can actually find the poem on the Poetry Foundation's website. Um, if you just type in Grace by Joy Harjo, you can find it. And you can also listen to her recite it on YouTube, which is also a really cool experience. Oh so, so yeah, so I would recommend those avenues if you want to look at it again. Otherwise, I forget which poetry collection that poem is in of hers. But the line that I read in my paper was... Um, it's, it reads, I know there is something larger than the memory of a dispossessed people. We have seen it. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure folks at APS can provide the link for where that is, and they already have. <laughs> so any questions that any of you have for each other in the few minutes we have left? I just, I have a question for Leandra, um, just because I love poetry and love that Leandra presented on poetry today. And I love the link, Marge, that you're seeing between sort of my introduction that sort of leads into this, this idea of poetry as restorative work, as reparative work that Leandra is developing. And um, so my question for Leandra was, in, when you were in the archive, did you find that your experience, they pushed you more toward poetry? Um. I think, well, so I've always been interested in poetry and everything. And so when I was in the archive, it really kind of clicked in my head how these two, like, I'm not sure what the word to use, these two ways of like understanding knowledge and history are more connected than like dissimilar and they like complement each other. But there's also like moments where they resist each other too and contradict one another. So um, being in the archives, if anything, it kind of just taught me to like think more about the connections between knowledge that's in the archives and then knowledge that we can find in poetry that's like always being published today and everything. Yeah. Kevin, I have another question for you. Could you say a little more about the time aspect of some of the Haudenosaunee creation stories and the way that they reflect ecological changes over time? Um, for some of that scholarship, I think it's in terms of the environmental uh, seed knowledge and plant knowledge, I, I would refer a lot of people to Dr. Amber Meadow Adams. That's, she focused on um, 
Hewitt's work with Gibson, the 1928 version, and John's work. And she really, she, in fact, she just had a fascinating article come out in a journal about some of, uh, about the seed knowledge that's contained within the story of creation. And it does follow an ecological pattern um, that it starts at the water's edge and moves towards a Carolinian forest. Um, the versions, I mean, range. I, I, one of the driving questions I had when I first began the research with John was for 75 years, people said between 20 and 40 versions. And nobody ever sat down and figured out how many and ended up 10 years ago to be about 32 to 33 versions and ranging from small page and a half things. But of course, there were ones that were emphasized over and over Parker's work, uh, David Cusick's work, but Hewitt remained relatively obscure. And they range from here on wind dot versions in the early 1600s with Jesuit recordings where they're more of a movie commentary like, well, this happened and this is what they believe but it doesn't really tell the story. But then there are some fascinating discoveries in the recent years where we were able to show that the Armstrong version in 1896 mirrors a version recorded by LaSalle in 1678. And that was because of the a collaborative work I did with uh, Michael Galvin at Ganondagan and uh, Eugene Teshdale, who we co-authored an article about the stability of oral culture through written word. Mm -hmm. And so there's some interesting dynamics to really kind of have at play in all of that. Thank you. Well, we have to wrap it up. It's, it's wonderful to have you here and I will pass it over to Kyle. My thanks as well, Johanna, Kevin, Leandra, and Marge for a fantastic conversation. Uh, I want to just remind everyone that we have one more panel today. It is at 3 p.m. It is on community-based language revitalization. So uh, stretch, get a glass of water, and we'll see you back here in an hour. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>